Can you hear me okay? Good. Well, greetings. My name is Joshua Walker. I am the assistant pastor currently at Church of the Redeemer over in Mesa. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening, and I bring the greetings of Church of the Redeemer to Reformation here. I'd like to thank also the elders and Pastor Ellis for allowing me this wonderful opportunity this evening to bring God's word to you. It's a true um, blessing. Joel and I have been friends for quite a few years since I've moved back in the valley after finishing PhD studies, and it's um, a joy to be here with you this evening. If you will, please join me in prayers. We ask the Lord's blessing upon the preaching of his word. Father, now as we continue worshiping you through the proclamation of your word, we ask, Father, that you would send your spirit to us, that you would help us to rightly understand the things that are here contained in your word, that you would help us to have the proper affectional response to these truths, that you would help us to love them and cherish them. And Lord, that you would move our feet to live in light of these glorious truths that we will see here in your word. Lord, we know that apart from you, we can do nothing. We are a needy people. And we ask now, Lord, that you would send your spirit and that you enable us to understand your truth. And we ask all this for the sake of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. I invite you, if you have a Bible, to turn with me to the first chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. We will be in a couple verses here in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Let me read God's word to you this evening. Paul says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Thus far, the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word, we ask that he would add his blessing to it. Our passage this evening, as you know, comes from the book of Romans. And I'm not sure that I need to tell you this, but for what it's worth, Romans is one of the most important biblical books in all of church history. When the church has felt that it has been threatened by some new teaching or when it has been confused as to what to believe in light of completing, uh, competing ideas or doctrines, or perhaps even both, it has turned back to the scriptures time and time again, and in particular, Paul's letter to the Romans. One noted commentator puts the importance of Romans this way. He writes, one can almost write the history of Christian theology by surveying the ways in which Romans has been interpreted. And he's right, of course. Think for an example with me of how an Augustinian monk and his reading and rereading of Romans was really the spark for the Protestant Reformation. I'm, of course, referring here to Martin Luther. So when we turn to Romans this evening, we do so with a holy reverence because we know what God has done through Romans and we pray he will continue to do through this letter. This brings us to our passage this evening, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It's found at the end of Paul's introduction to the letter. We know from verse 7 that Paul is writing this letter to the believers in Rome, which is the capital city of the Roman Empire. He is most, like, he is most likely writing in the year 55 AD, a mere 25 years or so after the death of Jesus. It's important to keep, this mind, to keep this fact in mind since Romans is about, as we'll see, the gospel of Christ, the good news about what Jesus came to do for sinners. It's the very same gospel that Jesus came to preach. There is a close connection, you see, between what Jesus taught and what Paul preaches in this letter. And, and the closeness of time will help us to see that. 
But you may be asking, how do we know that the letter to the Romans is fundamentally about the gospel? Well, there are at least two clues to this fact. First, look back at verse 1 of chapter 1 with me. In this verse, Paul makes clear to his readers that his apostolic mission is to preach the gospel of God. Paul writes this in Romans 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Right? That's what he says. His calling is to be set apart for the gospel of God. The second way that we know that Romans is fundamentally about the gospel is found in our text, Romans, 16, um, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And this really forms the, the thesis statement of the letter of Romans. That is, um, when, when we focus on this passage, we will see how it points to the gospel. In our passage, which I hope to illustrate is all about the gospel of Jesus, Paul sets forth in clear and concise terms what Romans is really all about. If, if we could take a theological and an exegetical microscope and, and, and zoom in on our passage, we would see the entirety of Romans contained here within these two verses. So what exactly is the thesis to the letter to the Romans? Or in other words, what is Romans really all about? Well, the answer to these important questions is found in my outline for this evening's sermon. The overarching point of Romans is that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's one, the power of God, two, the gospel is for the people of God, and three, the gospel gives the provision from God. Let me say that again. The thesis of Romans found in chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, is that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the people of God, which brings the provision from God. And we will look this evening at each of these points in turn. First, the power of God. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God. But how is it that the gospel is the power of God? Well, first we can look at the Greek word Paul uses here for power. It's a Greek word dunamis. Um, as an aside, an easy way to remember this Greek word, if anyone out there is learning Greek, is it sounds like the English word dynamite. Dunamis sounds kind of like dynamite. And if you light dynamite up, it goes boom. And it's very powerful, has a powerful effect. So this, this Greek term here, it means the ability to function in a particular way. In other words, Paul is noting that the gospel is the thing that God uses to do something particular. And we will see shortly what that something is. But I want to stop here for a moment to highlight the fact that the gospel, according to Paul, isn't merely something that is preached or proclaimed. It is that for sure, but it is also far more than that. The gospel is the means, it's the thing that God uses to bring about a change in the hearts and minds of sinners. Think with me of Acts chapter 9, for example. We have there the conversion of Saul. Saul is on the road into Damascus to persecute the Christians, and he is confronted powerfully by this gospel message of Jesus Christ and is changed from the person who was persecuting the church to the very one who is writing the letter that sits before us this evening. Think also of Acts chapter 8, where Philip proclaims Christ in Samaria. I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 8. We'll look at just a few verses there in Acts chapter 8. Acts 8, 4 through 8 says this, Now those who were scattered went about, preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the great signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, 
came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Here we see when the gospel is proclaimed, this power is, is so impactful that unclean spirits screamed and fled from this powerful message. Those who were unable to walk got up and walked because of this powerful message. The gospel itself is powerful to change the hearts and minds of people. We don't necessarily need clever words or sophisticated arguments to bring people to the gospel, to bring people to Christ. All we need to do is to be faithful to preach the gospel and unleash the power that is contained in it. I think an illustration may is an order that might help us understand this. It's been said that we don't defend the gospel the same way that we don't need to defend a lion. All we need to do to defend a lion is let it out of its cage and it'll take care of the rest. We can stand by and watch the lion protect and defend itself. Remember that, that the gospel is powerful. So proclaim this gospel, proclaim this good news and leave the results to God. This is one reason why Paul is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is a powerful instrument to do what God intends the word of God to do. And as we know from the scriptures, the word of God never returns to him void. It always accomplishes the purposes that he intends. But you're probably asking yourself, okay, I, I get the gospel is powerful to do what God intends, but, but what is it exactly that God intends for it to do? Well, thankfully, Paul does not leave us wondering about the answer to this vital question. The purpose of the gospel, he says in verse 16 of Romans chapter 1, is to provide salvation to everyone who believes. Look back at verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's what the gospel is intended to do. The gospel is a powerful instrument that God uses to save his people. This really is the essence of the good news that Christians have to proclaim. This is the essence of the Christian faith. If you were to boil down all of our theology, all of the scriptures, down to one little sentence, it would be something like this. God saves his people. And Paul goes on in Romans to make clear that we are saved in a very real sense from the very wrath of God himself. Look at the very next verse after our passage. Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. There is a way for those who have offended and committed crimes against the holy king of the universe. There is a way in the gospel for us to get out of this coming wrath. The marvelous thing about the gospels, brothers and sisters, is that the God who we have committed high treason against is the very same God who provides a way for us to be saved. And he provides a message that is powerful and able to save. As one commentator puts it, what Paul is saying here in verse 16 is that the gospel is God's effective power, active in the world of men to bring about deliverance from his wrath in the final judgment. The power of God is one reason that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. The second reason that Paul is not ashamed of the gospel is because it's for the people of God. Look back with me at the end of verse 16. Paul says that, it's to, that salvation is for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek this phrase clarifies what Paul just said about everyone who believes. 
all the people that believe in the gospel are made up of either Jews or Gentiles. There's no other option. You're either a Jew or you're Gentile. If you're sitting here saying, I don't know which one I am, you're probably a Gentile. Paul's main thrust in bringing this up is that everyone is on the same footing as far as the gospel is concerned. In other words, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for both believing Jews and believing Gentiles. There is not an ethnic hierarchy when it comes to the gospel. But you might be asking, wait, wait a minute, I, I hear that, but doesn't the text say to the Jew first? Preacher, you're, you're, you're missing this here. Well, yes, I see that. So, so what does Paul mean when he indicates to the Jew first, if both are on the same footing as far as the gospel is concerned? Well, commentators, as you may have guessed, disagree about the meaning of this firstness here. However, I think the most simple and best way to understand it is temporally, that is, in terms of time, not in terms of supremacy or priority. And there, there's two ways I think we can look at this. First, the Jewish people were preached the gospel in the Old Testament. Think, thinking of examples in Genesis 3.15, we have what is known as the Proto-Evangelium, the, the gospel preached beforehand, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. They were given a gospel proclamation, the Jewish people were, back in Genesis 3.15. Also, we know from the book of Acts that when Paul would preach the gospel, the first thing he would do is he would go to the synagogues. He would go from city to city, town to town, and he would go into the synagogues where the Jews were, and he would preach about Jesus to the Jews. Then, once they had rejected him, and his gospel, which was a sadly common response, he would then go and preach to the Gentiles. For example, in Acts 17, we see this. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them, that is, with the Jews, from the scriptures, from the Old Testament, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. So we have there, Paul goes to the Jews using the Hebrew scriptures and says, look, these scriptures, they testify to Jesus. And then we see in that same chapter of Acts, Acts 17, we see Paul going into Athens to preach the gospel to those who were there, to the Gentiles. In other words, there's no particular reason to understand the word first in Romans chapter 1, as um, some sort of preeminence of the Jewish people. With God, we are all on the same footing when it comes to the gospel. This is confirmed by Paul elsewhere. In Galatians chapter 3, he writes this, For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So in Galatians 3, we see Paul is making it clear that everyone who believes is the offspring of Abraham. In other words, everyone who trusts the promises made in the gospel, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, will inherit the blessings of Abraham. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. The point is that the gospel is for everyone. If you are sitting here today and you're thinking to yourself, yes, I, I hear what you're saying, the gospel is for everybody, but you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I did yesterday or last week or last year. And you're right, I, I don't know, but God knows. And he tells you in his word that this is for everyone who believes. If you reach out in faith, 
and you say, I believe what this is saying, then the scriptures tell us, God, who does know what you have been through, tells us that this is for you. No one is outside of the reach of the gospel. This is another reason why Paul is not ashamed of the gospel that he preached to the Jews and the Gentiles. It's the same consistent message about God providing a way to escape the coming wrath. That's why he's not ashamed of this, because he can go to the Jews and the Gentiles with one consistent message. But you might be asking, well, well what exactly is that message? H how exactly does the gospel get a way of escape for both Jews and Gentiles who are guilty? Well, that brings us to our third and final point this evening. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it's the provision of, from God. Verse 17 is intended to give us an answer to this question about how is it that the gospel is good news. Look back with me at verse 17 of Romans chapter 1. For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith faith. Paul's answer to how we are to escape the coming wrath is found in this phrase, the righteousness of God. Let me unpack this phrase for us, the righteousness of God. Even though there's a lot of debate among scholars on what this means, I think there's little doubt that this phrase can only refer to the righteous status that God imputes or gives or credits to those who believe. This wasn't planned, but the reading we had from the Heidelberg Catechism was about this very topic that we are talking about, that Paul is addressing here. Let me explain why this is the case. But in order to understand the solution to the problem, we must first understand exactly the nature of the problem itself so we can rightly understand the solution. In Romans chapter 1 through 5, Paul uses what are known as legal terms. That is, terms that are found in the courtroom. That, that Think of the courtroom illustration. So for example, in our day and age, if I said that the person had a gavel in their hand and they gave a verdict and they read a sentence, we would all immediately start to think of a courtroom with a judge and, and a jury and a plaintiff. Well, well, Paul does the same thing here. He uses legal terms such as impute, righteousness, and justification, just to name a few. These are all legal terms. They should bring to mind the courtroom. In Paul's way of framing this discussion, he depicts a courtroom. And in this courtroom, God is the judge. And we are the guilty defendant. In the rest of chapter 1 and on into chapter 3, Paul lays out all the evidence that is piled up against us. And he concludes, as the prosecuting attorney, he concludes his case with these words in chapter 3. None is righteous. No, not one. Everyone is guilty God, in other words, isn't wrathful at us or isn't angry at us for no reason. No, rather, he is angry at us for all the right reasons. And that's what Paul painstakingly lays out in the first part of Romans. So what does this have to do with our passage this evening? What does this courtroom and God's wrath and anger have to do with this passage? Well, in short, everything you see, it's this problem of God's wrath and its solution that Paul is so eager to proclaim. Remember, Paul was once a person who stoned Christians to death. 
This isn't an abstract theological debate that Paul's having with Jews of his day or the Gentiles of his day. This is a real problem for Paul. This is an existential problem for Paul. It's an experiential problem that he has. I was an enemy of God who was going to persecute his people. How is it that I can now be not guilty of this? And if you look into your heart and are truthful this evening, you will see that this isn't just a problem for Paul. It's a problem for you. And it's a problem for me. The righteousness that God gives in the gospel is the answer to this problem. Let me explain. Think back with me to the courtroom analogy that Paul is drawing on here. There's a judge on the bench, and he's a good judge. He's a righteous judge. He's a just judge. He isn't simply going to look at a guilty person and say, well, I know you're trying your best. I, I, I know you did that horrendous crime, but, but, but you're doing okay, so I'm going to say not guilty. If a judge did that, we would be outraged. We would say, get them off the bench because they are a wicked judge. But God doesn't do that because he is a good judge. In order for God to give us the verdict of not guilty, we need to be, at least legally speaking, not guilty. Otherwise, he would be unjust. This is why the righteousness that God gives us in Christ is so vital to the gospel. Look back at our text with me. Right after Paul says that the gospel reveals the righteousness of God, he quotes from the Old Testament. Habakkuk 2.4, he says, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul quotes this passage to show that a righteous person lives by faith. But then he goes on in Romans to belabor the point that no one is righteous. So Paul, what are you doing? You say the righteous shall live by faith, but then you tell me in chapter 3 that no one is righteous. What's going on? Well, the person in Romans 1.17 who is righteous must not be righteous in and of themselves. Instead, they're righteous because of another. This is what theologians refer to as alien righteousness. Now, don't, don't start thinking of little green men with antennas coming down from Mars. That's not what they mean by aliens. Rather, what they mean is it's not natural to the person who is righteous. Just as the power of God from verse 16 doesn't stay with God, but comes and acts powerfully in the world, and just as the wrath of God in verse 18 doesn't stay with God, but is poured out on deserving people, so too the righteousness of God in verse 17 doesn't stay with God. Instead, he imputes it or gives it or credits it to his people. So think back with me to the courtroom. The judge is about to pronounce that you are guilty because you are. But before he renders his sentence, the judge's own son bursts into the back of the courtroom. His hands are covered in blood. There's blood flowing from the crown on his head. And he says to the judge, he says to his father, wait, this person is with me. I have already paid their sentence. Then the judge's son takes off his clean, pristine, white robes and puts them on you to cover you. This, brothers and sisters, is what the gospel is all about. The son of the judge took your unrighteousness upon himself and gave you his perfect record in the eyes of the law. That's what his righteousness is. He lived a perfect life for you so that when the judge looks at you, he doesn't see the things that we have done wrong, legally speaking, but he sees Jesus and what he has done. This is why Paul can write in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and because of him, 
you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Paul says here that Jesus became our righteousness. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because it sets forth this wonderful and gracious gift of God's own righteousness given to people who not only don't deserve it, but who have done things to undeserve it. Let me conclude. Remember back to the beginning of this, where I mentioned how an Augustinian monk was reading and rereading Romans and how that sparked the Reformation. It was here that Martin Luther was reading in the book of Romans, and he came to see this glorious truth of imputed righteousness, this righteousness that, that he can't muster up in himself as the church of his day taught, that, that you have to go and do this and that, and once you've done all of this, then and only then will God smile upon you. And he was trying and trying and trying, and he couldn't measure up because he recognized that his heart was full of sin. And when he read these verses here in Romans, he was gripped by this fact that it's not based on what we have done, but on what Jesus has done. Will you this evening, with Paul, stop working to please God and start resting in what God has done for you in Christ. All you need to do is look to his son and receive his gospel, the gospel that reveals that he has given you all that is his, including his account of perfect life lived in the eyes of God, his righteousness. Jesus gives you all. This, brothers and sisters, is why Paul is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God for the people of God, which brings the provision from God. This is why Paul can say later in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me say that again. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Believer, let that sink into your soul. Let me leave you with these words of one of my favorite hymns. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we ask that this gospel would be one that is proclaimed here in Arizona, here in Phoenix, here in Mesa, here in Apache Junction. Lord, we ask that this gospel message would be powerfully and persuasively proclaimed so that your word can go forth and that sinners who are lost in a dying world can come to see the light of Jesus. Lord, we ask that as we end this Lord's Day, we can turn and look to Jesus, knowing that it's because of him that we are able to come to you and cry out, Father, you are our Father because of what Jesus has done. We are humbled by this fact. Lord, we ask that you would help us to live in light of these truths, that you would help our lives to be one that reflects a commitment to this gospel that it's nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to your cross we cling, Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice on our behalf, for taking our punishment and giving us your perfect record of rightness. That's what righteousness is. Jesus, we thank you and we pray all this in your name. Amen.